Welcome, my name is Jonathan Byrne, I'm a cardiologist from uh, the UK. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Tom Johnson, a colleague from Bristol. We're here to discuss some of the highlights of the meeting this year with a particular focus on the coronary uh, information and data presented here. It's been a fantastic meeting looking back at 40 years of angioplasty, uh, a real sense of history. And a great to see that the education is firmly embedded in the programme with the European Fellows course integral to the meeting this year. We're going to discuss some of the major uh, discussion points of the meeting this year. I'm going to move over to Tom and ask him really to talk first about the evolving and interesting data in the bars of the scaffold arena. Tom. John, thanks. Th th there's been a lot discussed about BBS again uh, this year, uh, with particular emphasis uh, on, again, ongoing uh, data being drawn from uh, global registries, from the Absorb Japan, Absorb China data. Uh, we also heard uh, some new data from the IDA investigators from Amsterdam. And certainly we see with the first generation devices still this ongoing signal in terms of stent thrombosis. Um, clearly there was a very high stent thrombosis rate uh, associated with the uh, IDA investigators, 4% uh, over, the, over the period. And in fact, the trial uh, was stopped early. They admitted in the discussion actually that that was stopped uh, as a result of um, the three-year Absorb 2 data that was published last year. Having said that, there's some conflicting and, and contrasting kind of messages that come from the registries. So uh, the UK registry was presented for the first time by Andreas uh, Baumbach and uh, that showed again this stent thrombosis issue, but to a far lesser extent, just 1.4% uh, across the 12 months uh, that we've investigated. And uh, there it seemed clearer that, again, small vessel uh, under expansion, poor preparation was potentially the driver. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think there's still lots to learn. Uh, in terms of the first generation BVS. And there's some interesting data from the second generation uh, bars of wobble scaffolds. I think it's fair to say that uh, it'd be worth talking a little bit about that evolving yep. data because that may uh, deal with some of the weaknesses of the first generation devices. I, I think clearly the, the technology uh, is evolving and we had some data uh, on the Magmaris from uh, Michael Howdy. So uh, we had the two year uh, Biosolve data and that uh, you know, is a different device, obviously magnesium, uh, and we saw a 0% stent thrombosis rate. So there are new technologies evolving, there have been additional uh, plenary sessions looking at the many devices that, that we may have on offer in the future. So I think it's still a space to, to be excited by. I agree, I think it's fair to say that will evolve significantly in the coming 12 to 24 months. And if we move to more complex intervention, particularly chronic total occlusions, but interesting data presented here on, on that aspect of well, coronary intervention as well, hasn't some there? Some reassuring data, I, I guess. So, uh, you know, off the back of decision CTO, there were maybe some uh, concerns about whether we see an advantage with the reopening of CTO in the stable setting. Uh, and so Gerald Werner presented for the first time the Euro CTO data and highlighted uh, the, the primary endpoint being one of uh, quality of life questionnaire, looking at reduction of angina, looking at um, uh, symptom relief. And we saw an advantage uh, clearly through the reopening of the CTO versus optimal medical therapy. Now there was a, a clear distinction really between now the two trials that we have with conflicting uh, results. Uh, and uh, the uh, Euro CTO investigators should be commended on uh, having assessed viability uh, uh, having made a formal assessment of those patients before including them in the trial. There's still a lot more data that we haven't had at our disposal to, to pick through to understand the, you know, the true detail of the study, but, but it's an encouraging result all the same. I think it's been inter interesting to delve, delve into the data as more of it emerges. I think we'll learn a lot more from it. And finally, if we move from intervention to physiology and intervention, there's been very interesting discussions here on the uh, IFR, FFR arguments and perhaps some, some uh, alignment in thinking and how these should be used. Perhaps you could enlighten us yeah, on absolutely. On so data. obviously we now have a very large body of evidence assessing head-to-head -head IFR and FFR <coughs> and so this week Javier Escanet uh, presented the pooled data 
uh, from IFR Sweetheart and Define Flair, over 4,000 patients, uh, and highlighted uh, really that both FFR and IFR are achieving very, very effective uh, results in terms of uh, deferral and treatment strategies. Um, there is some interesting uh, data, again, to kind of tease out from that in terms of uh, the fact that we now have a much larger body of evidence within the ACS cohort. And so we maybe see a slight difference in the way that IFR and FFR uh, guide us in terms of revascularization strategy. So we saw a, a difference uh, in uh, the outcomes between ACS and uh, the stable setting for FFR and actually no significance between the IFR groups. Uh, but I think probably the, the, the greatest message is that over this period of 20 years almost from DEFER, the first study that defined the importance of physiological assessment, we see a, a halving almost of, of the overall event rates driven by this physiological approach to our guided angioplasty. And so, you know, we see a, a very nice kind of evolution of innovation, very much in keeping with this special edition PCR of 40 years of angioplasty. And it's a very nice message to end on, 40 years of progression development with new tools, new innovative devices, which help us to really obtain the best outcomes for all of our patients. Thank you very much, Tom.